Man, God is so, so good. This morning, I want to start with just some testimonies of what God has been doing through prayer. And the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, which is the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. And some of you have been sharing stories of what God is doing in your life. I want to say, keep doing that. That is so powerful. When you share your story, not only does it give God glory, but it gives someone else permission to believe for that thing. It's a word of prophecy to them where they're like, whoa, if God did that for them, for him, for her, he's going to do it for me. I'm going to believe it. Come on. So this week uh, we had somebody who they had prayed for a job last week. And then this week God provided several jobs. So thank you, Jesus. Come on. We also had someone who was praying for their husband to come to church. It was a a wife who comes by herself, and she was praying for her husband and standing on that promise, you know, that one in Acts that says, you believe not only you and your household will be saved, and her husband has been coming to church with her and actually loving it even more than she does. Come on, thank you, Jesus. And my heart is that over the next couple of weeks, we'll get people sharing their stories on stage like we did at Easter, just giving God credit for what he's doing. And if you have any prayer requests, if you have any needs in your life, anything that you're believing God for, I want to encourage you, write it on these prayer walls. There's markers on the steps there on both sides. Write it on the walls before church when you're in here waiting, after church, when the prayer team's up front, anytime. Write those down, and then what happens is our prayer team is here during the week. They're praying over those things. Our staff is praying over those things, and you're praying over those things. Come on. And we're expecting God to do what only He can do. He loves when we expect big things from Him. So uh, when you have stories of what God has done, you can email them to info at nyhopechurch.com, info at nyhopechurch.com, and we will share them with the whole family here, okay? All right, this is week five of the sauce. We say prayer is the sauce that we put on everything. Come on, it's so good. You got to put it on everything. I don't know if you guys saw in the news or not, but this week McDonald's started selling their sauce as an extra thing, their, their secret sauce for their Big Macs. You can get a whole little thing of it, a whole tub of it. So you can dip your french fries in it, you can dip your Big Mac in it, you can take it home, put it on your salad. It's so good, they're like, all right, for a limited time only, let's just let everybody have some sauce to go. And it reminded me of when I was growing up, every Friday in the summer, my mom would take us grocery shopping, and she had a whole routine. And after grocery shopping, she would take us to McDonald's for lunch. And our McDonald's, it had a play place. That was back when those were safe, you know. We had a play place. It was so fun. And we would get, I would get the same order every week, which was a Big Mac and a vanilla milkshake. And we probably did that routine for a solid 10 years. Big Mac every week. And now, now that I have children, I never feed them McDonald's, like, ever. <laughs> The only reason that they know what McDonald's is is because of my husband. He, he's the fun one, right? I'm the healthy one, he's the fun one. And we balance each other out. Raise your hand if you love taking your people to McDonald's, you love to eat at McDonald's, you take your kids. Raise your hand, it's okay, admit it, you're fun. That's good. I went for a long time. Okay, raise your hand if you're like, I'm not eating there. Okay, a lot more people, but you know what? That's okay. You're not wrong, okay? There's some on each side. I went to McDonald's for a long time, and I turned out great. Come on. Thank you. But growing up Big Macs every Friday, it was our rhythm for, you know, a long time. We create a lot of rhythms around food. We have celebrations around food, gatherings around food, right? Like when you go to a party, you're like, yeah, but what are we going to eat at the party? What's the food? Do I need to eat before I go? Who's making the food? That's a big one for me. I have to know who made it. For me, I have lots of routines around food. I eat breakfast at 6 a.m. most days. Uh, except for Sundays. I eat lunch at 11 a.m. And the whole team and I, we eat lunch together at 11 a.m. Except for Sundays. If I ate lunch at 11 a.m., it would be like bringing a Big Mac on stage at the next experience. It would be kind of awkward. Sorry, I have a routine. 
And then we usually have dinner around 6 p.m. In my younger days, I had dessert every night at 8 p.m. I remember one day when I was first married, I could get like a whole little pint of Ben and Jerry's and just eat one every night. And now that I'm almost 40, I'm like, I can't do that anymore. It just doesn't serve me. You probably have some sort of food rhythms though too, even if you only eat once a day. Like my husband, he only eats dinner, but it's still a rhythm. You know the things that matter, we create rhythms around. Think about your work-life balance. You probably have some rhythms for that too. Uh, For me, Mondays, I write my sermons. Tuesdays, I have meetings with our staff and we have event meetings. Wednesdays, I do some more writing. Thursdays, we practice everything we're going to do for Sunday, and I do some counseling meetings. Fridays, I do the work of my life. Saturdays, I have Sabbath Saturday, spend time with God, thank Him for His gifts, my family, good food, good activities, everything that He's given. And Sunday, it's the best day of the week. You probably have those rhythms too. The things that we care about, we develop rhythms to set ourselves up for success. We have rhythms around our kids, you know? Morning, wake up, routine, rhythm, brush your teeth, put on your shoes, change, do all the things. School routines, after school rhythm, get ready for bed rhythm, and that's good. Those rhythms, they help our kids to thrive, right? There's safety in those rhythms. You have workout rhythms, TV rhythms, social rhythms. We have marriage rhythms. My husband and I, every night, we try to talk when our kids go to bed at 8 p.m. Maybe it's for five minutes, Or maybe it's like, wow, we have so much to process, we talk for three hours. It's a rhythm. We have date nights on Friday nights. Uh, If you were at our vision party a couple weeks ago, you probably saw, we snuck out at 8.45 because we had dinner reservations. It's a rhythm that I'm committed to, that we're committed to for our marriage. We're flexible around our rhythms, yes. You know, they could be later in the day or earlier, but we're committed to them. And they're really just a starting point. We can always add to our rhythms, but they're a baseline. It's like once you've made a commitment, you don't even have to think about it. It's just what we do. Commitments, not feelings, are how we show our love. Think about it. Commitments, not feelings, are how we show our love. Yes, feelings are good, but there are sometimes you don't feel like doing some things, right? There are sometimes I don't feel like going on a date but I'm committed to my husband. When you love someone, you make a commitment to marry him, right? Because we love Jesus, we have rhythms and commitments around church. We're here today, that's a rhythm. Sunday, starting my week at church. Maybe your kids go to Hope Youth, you go to family night, maybe you go to prayer and worship on uh, every other Thursday. Those are all good rhythms. Rhythms are structures that support our deepest soul longings. You know, we're each born with a desire to relate to God. We don't always know it. Sometimes we fill our life with a lot of things before we realize it, but we're created for intimacy with Him. And when we don't feel intimacy with Him, we're like, is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with Him? No, 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 no. When we don't feel intimacy with God, it's because we don't have a daily prayer rhythm. It's as simple as that. Can you imagine talking to your spouse once a week on Sundays, you wouldn't feel intimacy there either. Can you imagine only eating once a week or working out once a week or parenting your kids once a week? It doesn't work in any area, but we try to do it with God. And then we don't feel that intimacy. Jesus invites us to experience his rhythms. He says, I have a better way. Matthew 11, 28, he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. His rhythms are not forced. They're not work. They're not obligations. There's rhythms. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. He says, my rhythms are free and light. I mean, just reading that verse, I feel, ha, ah, light. His rhythms, they're not religious. They're not legalistic. They're based on love. They're a response to God's love. 
They're not another thing to add to your already busy life that weighs you down. Actually, his rhythms are the things that help you carry all the other things. In another translation, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And what that's a picture of is being yoked up to Jesus like an ox of farming equipment where he's carrying the load. You're yoked up to him. His rhythms are light and easy. They're not another thing to add to everything else. Jesus lived in a world without clocks. Have you ever thought about that? They're like, gee, what time is it? I don't know, where's the sun? Is it night or day? The passage of time, it was marked by prayer. Everything else fit around that rhythm. God was his first priority. Something sets the rhythm for our lives. There's always something. It could be our phone notifications, our alarms. It could be our Netflix release schedule, like, oh, that show's coming out this Friday, and then on Saturday I'm watching this, and on Monday that thing. It could be our work schedule. They're not bad things. It could be our countdown to the weekend or vacation. But are those things something that makes us whole? Do our rhythms, do those things, do they love us? Or do they want to control us? Is it concerned for your deepest well-being or is it trying to sell you something? Is your rhythm shaping you into the best version of yourself or does it make you selfish? Does it leave you feeling alive and free or exhausted? Whatever is at the center of your rhythms, it forms you into its image and it defines you. And we can choose to have Jesus at the center. Romans 12.1 says, here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. God, here's my whole life. I submit it to you. It's yours, God. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. I thought being good was the best thing I could do for him. No. I thought, you know, my religious works were the best thing. Nope. Embracing what he has already done. Jesus said it is finished. Embracing what he did is the best thing you can do for him. And I love this next part. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Our culture, the rhythms are based on a lot of things. But Jesus' rhythms, they're based on time with God. Next verse, instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. He's saying, take what you're already doing. Submit it to God as an offering. Fix your attention on him. Embrace what he's already done and he'll start to transform you from the inside out. His rhythms will form you into the image of Jesus. He's saying, God, my morning, it's yours. My lunch, it's yours. My work, it's yours. God, my leisure time, my walking around life, it's yours. He's not saying add more to your life. He's saying invite God to invade what you're already doing, your ordinary life. Often we compartmentalize prayer. We say, well, my prayer life is like tacked on top of all that other stuff. But that's not what God intended. He wants us to spend time with him throughout our day. You can pray anytime. If you're home folding laundry, you could be praying, I plead the blood of Jesus over these clothes that I'm about to wear. I plead the blood of Jesus over myself, over my kids. They're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus over my family. You take your laundry time and you make it a prayer time. You can pray during your commute. You can worship during your commute. You can pray before you head into a meeting with a client or with your team or before you head into surgery. Whatever you're about to do, you can pray. And then when you're done doing that thing, you can pray. And then when you're at the grocery store, you can silently pray over strangers. Prayer is not limited to set times. It's not limited to starting with, dear Heavenly Father, and signing off with, in Jesus' name, amen. No, no, no. It's an ongoing call with God. 
It's an ongoing conversation. And instead of thinking we need to add God to our lives, that we need to make time for him, what if we shift our perspective and we say, God is my life. He is my life. Colossians 3, 4 says, your real life is Christ. Your real life. So what happens is we've been crucified with Christ when we trust in Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He lives in me. And me and Jesus, we're hidden together in God. We're all united. He's my life. I can't separate myself from him. The Holy Spirit lives in me. He's with me all the time. Psalm 139.7 says it like this. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. He is with you all the time when you lie down to go to bed, when you wake up in the morning. In fact, he's not sleeping when you're sleeping. He's watching over you. He's there every moment in between. But if you think about our human experience, we've all had people leave us. We've had experiences that shape our ability to believe that. And so what I'm trying to get us to do today is believe what God says and take him at his word. Because probably in elementary school, you made some friends, and for some reason one day, one of them stopped liking you. And it wasn't fair, but it's a normal childhood experience. And maybe in high school, you were dating your high school sweetheart, and they broke up with you, and you experienced what it's like for someone to leave you. Or maybe you have deeper experiences where when you were a kid, if you didn't get a good grade on a test, or if you misbehaved, your parents would cut their love off from you. And maybe they couldn't process some things. Or maybe you are married and your spouse left you. Or maybe you gave your best at a job and you got fired. And so over and over and over, experience says, they'll leave. This won't last. But God is different. Nothing can take us out of his presence. He never leaves us. The Bible says, what can separate us from the love of God? Come on, nothing. And prayer, it makes us aware of his presence in every moment. Because he's always there. Sometimes we just don't realize. Jesus says, watch how I do it. Watch how I invest my time with the Father. I'll show you what it's like. And he followed the traditional Jewish prayer schedule, which was morning, midday, and then evening, and he followed that, but that was a starting point. There were lots of other times he prayed too. And I think we can take that framework today and we can use it for our rhythms as well. So first, morning, what did he do? What could we do? I think one really good practice for us is to get in the word. In the morning, we get in the word of God. We say, Holy Spirit, show me what I need for today. Or we do some research, we Google, Scripture's on forgiveness because I still need to forgive that person from yesterday and let him speak through his truth. And we start every day getting our thoughts and feelings in alignment with him because our feelings are valid, our thoughts are real, but his truth is the ultimate truth. And so we want to get in alignment with him. And as we do that, we're awakening to his presence in our lives, to who he is, and then who we are because of him. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Oh, that's so tempting sometimes, right? Next verse. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God because it's not about you anyway. And you'll begin to sense his grace. How do you sense his grace? Get in his presence. Be there simply and honestly and authentically and vulnerably before him. And you'll shift your focus from you to him. Take what you're already doing in your life, what you're already doing, and place it before God as an offering. Don't add God on top of everything else, but maybe there's something, a rhythm that you want to replace. Maybe hitting the snooze, you're like, okay, it's time to replace that rhythm. 
with reading the word of God. Maybe it's listening to your podcast. You're like, I'm going to replace it with God's word. Or waking up and scrolling social media or the news. They're not bad things, but I need the truth of God's word in me to start my day. It's not more time, it's more intentional time, simply replacing one thing that we're already doing in our morning. If you have kids or teens, you can have them do this too. There's a family in our church, when their kids are old enough to read, when they're like five, they give them their own devotional. They're like, all right, you spend your time with God. And then they come together as a family and they talk about what God is showing them. We wanna start our day in the word. So morning routine, the word. Morning rhythm, the word. Lunch, lunch rhythm, that's the next time that the Jewish people prayed. Lunch rhythm could be worship, worship. Invite God into your already established lunch break. If you work outside of the home, you probably have a set time, just like we do, 11 a.m. You have a set time where you go for lunch, you break for lunch, you pause for lunch, you go on a walk, whatever you do, that's your time to worship. Maybe you're at home and you're prepping food that's a great time to worship. That's what the apostle Peter did. He also followed the three times a day rhythm of Jesus. Acts 10, 9 says, about noon the next day as they came near Joppa, Peter was going up to the roof to pray. He was hungry, he wanted to eat, but while the food was being prepared, he had a vision. I love how human Peter is. He's like, I'm hungry, I wanna eat. It's not ready yet, so I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna use this time to pray. We can do the same thing. And because he turned aside, he spent time with God, God gave him a vision in that time. In Peter's vision, God told him that the good news of Jesus is for everyone, not for the Jews. It's a huge like news flash, like culture changing, life changing. It matters for us today that God is not just for the Jewish people. But the cool thing is that God spoke in the normal, everyday rhythm of lunch prayer. Like Peter was just getting ready for lunch. God speaks in those everyday, normal moments, in those rhythms. He speaks in the everyday. He does it a lot in the Bible. The Holy Spirit, when he came at Pentecost, the disciples were together praying their morning prayer, their normal morning prayer. The disciples, they did miracles on their way to midday prayer. Just going to prayer like always, doing some miracles on the way. Think about our students here at chapel, God has been meeting the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders on Fridays so sweetly in their room, in their normal, everyday chapel routine. It's the same for us, people of hope. We come here on Sundays, and I hope that you're experiencing God in a new way, in your normal, daily rhythm. So if you're talking to God at lunch, what could you talk to him about? You worship, you thank him for your lunch, thank you for the good things in your day so far, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be five minutes. Take a few minutes to acknowledge who he is, his presence, and cultivate gratitude in your heart. Fix your attention on God, like we read. Shift your focus from you to him and sense his grace. At lunch, we worship. So morning, in the word, at lunch, we worship. And then the evening, we say, where are you, God? Where were you today? Where? Where have I seen God in my day? We do a daily review. This is where we look for God in the highs and the lows, in the dark moments, in the celebratory light moments. Take five minutes at the end of the day. Go back over your day with God. Just be simple and still before him. Say, God, will you show me where you were present? Will you show me where I responded to your presence? Because sometimes I miss it, right? Maybe somebody showed you a kindness as you look back over your day in the moment you're like, oh, they're a nice person. But in the evening you're like, that was God. That was God giving me exactly what I needed in that moment. That happened to me a few weeks ago. Uh, on Sunday morning someone came up to me and they said, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being my pastor. My life has changed over this past year. And I don't even know why I'm telling you this right now, actually. And I just said, thank you, praise God, that's awesome. And then later that day, someone messaged us and just said some really mean things. You know, nobody hated me until I was a pastor, but it comes with the territory. And that's okay. It's a spiritual thing. And God's got my back, right? So when that happened, 
when that happened, I was able to immediately go to that morning where someone had spoken truth into my life and put courage into me, and I was able to easily reject that thing and say, that's not true, I forgive them, I'm gonna meditate on the truth. But God did that, he knew that was gonna happen. Maybe you pass an accident on the highway and you're like, wow, thank you Jesus that I was running late today. Like I was annoyed that my kids weren't getting all their stuff on fast enough to get out the door, but God, you saved me from being near that accident. Uh, maybe you look back over your day and you'll, you're like, I'm so thankful that I listened to you, God, and I was gonna be critical in that moment, but I wasn't because of you. Maybe you look back and you're like, I was selfless when I could have been so easily selfish. Maybe the verse that you read that morning was perfect for the day as you're thinking back over your day. It's not a coincidence that the one verse that you read out of the 31,103 scriptures in the Bible was the one that you read that day. That's God speaking to you. I'm tired of us saying, I don't know if I'm hearing from God. Come on. He's speaking to you. You can trust him. It's not a coincidence. He's that good to give you the exact right thing in the right moment. That's who he is. Maybe you look back over your day and you're like, wow, I was moving too fast to even notice God. Or I was really stubborn. I felt you wanted me to do something, God, and I said no. Or maybe I was lazy or afraid. Places where in the future we can make different choices. Or even places that God wants us to go back and revisit where we need to apologize or where we need to say something where we really held back, places where we can become more like Jesus. Psalm 139, 23 says, Search me, O God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts, point out anything in me that offends you, lead me along the path of everlasting life. A daily review is a safe place to identify where we're not like Jesus so we can become more like him. It's a place where our unhealthy places, they're stripped away gently by his grace, by his healing. The Holy Spirit reveals to us truths as we can handle it. You might be thinking of this whole daily review thing and like, whoa, God, I don't wanna know what you thought about my day because I'm already hard on myself. No, 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 that's not who he is. The Holy Spirit reminds us of who we are in Jesus and he brings things to our minds as we need to address them. Readily recognize what God wants you to do and respond to it. That's all. Let him guide you. You know, most of us, we lack positive role models for processing and understanding and taking personal responsibility for who we choose to be or what we choose to do. And what happens in most families or workplaces, in most social units, instead of taking responsibility, we pass responsibility to someone else and they pass it to someone else. And what happens is the weakest, most defenseless person gets blamed for everything. Our culture in general says, it's not a big deal if you do whatever you want, but it doesn't lead to life. God wants us to come boldly to him and find mercy and help when we need it, when we're in over our heads, when we miss the mark, when we've messed up, when we cause pain, when we find something dark about ourselves, when we have unforgiveness or fear or jealousy or hatred. He doesn't want us to internalize those things when we do that, we suffer. Psalm 32, three says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through groaning all day long. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord. He's saying, when we miss the mark, when we do mess up, because we're human, if we stay silent about those things, we suffer. God designed us not to tolerate sin. It's fun sometimes for a season, but it is always followed by guilt and consequences because the wages of sin, it's always death. Those things aren't from God, it's from sin. The Holy Spirit, he reminds us, that's not who you are. Let's address this thing, let's make a course correction. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Guilt can be a sign that something's wrong and confession to God, as a part of our daily re review, it's a way to address it. You know God already knows all of our flaws, but there's freedom when we say, God, I see it too. I see it, and I wanna own it. 
and I want to submit it to you. It's like when my kids make a big mess. I already know they made the mess. Like you hear the crash, you know, you see the evidence, but they feel freer when they know that I know and I can give them a big hug and I can help them with their mess. The Bible doesn't say you need to go to confession every day or have an accountability partner or your prayer life needs to be a big confession list. I met someone one time, they're like, every night I confess all my sins to God. That's how I pray to him. That doesn't sound like a fun relationship. Imagine that's how you're related to your spouse or your friend, just confessing everything you ever did wrong and focusing on you. Confession is just acknowledging your need for grace. It's acknowledging your need for him. God's grace, it breaks the power of sin and darkness and you find healing when you confess to him. It's a key that he gives us to be free and whole. The book of James, it also says we can share those things with safe people. We can confess to other people. James 5, 16 says, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. It's saying sin plus confession equals healing. Sin and silence is suffering, but sin and confession, bringing God's light into a situation, it brings healing. We don't confess to earn forgiveness. That would be a dead religious work. It's like, if I do this, then God does that. No, 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 no. At the cross, all those things were already taken care of. We confess to receive wholeness and healing and grace. And God, he uses other people to give us grace when we share our struggles with them. It was so sweet this week at family night. Someone shared at their table some really big things that their family was going through that they didn't even plan to share. They're like, I don't even know why I confessed that. But instead of finding judgment and condemnation, they found healing and grace and help. And their table, they prayed for them. And that's how God's grace comes through people. Once you've confessed something, if you choose to continue to feel guilt, that's not God's way. You're allowing the enemy then to have a foothold in your life and to speak lies to you. You're saying, I don't believe the grace of God is good enough for me. But the Bible says that God remembers your sins no more. When he forgives you, it's for real, forever. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to punish yourself. He's not punishing you. So that's the daily review, just going over your day with God and saying, God, where were you in my day today? How can I learn to see you more? Acknowledging him in all the moments and having a clean conscience before him and then going to bed in peace. And just like Jesus, we can have a daily prayer rhythm that gives life to our lives. Put it on your calendar. Make it the most important thing in your day. Before your kids' sports schedules, your doctor's appointments, your business meetings, your date night, everything else that matters, it might seem sacrificial like, oh, I'm putting God here and here and here. But it's really not because once you get into that rhythm, everything else follows. And then suddenly you don't even need those therapy appointments for your kids because Jesus is helping them. When we put him first, everything else gets into alignment. And that's just a starting point to see what happens when you start there. Without the power of God in your life, it might seem impossible. Like, I don't know if I could do this three times a day. But once you step into it by faith and you rest in what God is doing and you realize you're not alone, he's with you, it's a better life. And what happens is he actually empowers you to live for him. You know, Jesus, he also prayed at other times. He prayed when people asked him to pray for him. He had spontaneous prayer. He prayed with his disciples and alone in the synagogue, in a desert, in the garden, his whole life, his everyday ordinary life. The possibilities are endless. I heard Joseph Prince say one time, you can pray to God when you're on the toilet. Don't be so religious that you limit him to certain places. The point is spending time with him. I think about it as a parent, I've sat on the tub while my kids are on the toilet, just talking to them, you know, especially when they're potty training. God is not religious. He wants to relate to you. He's a good father. The point is that he's worth inviting into every moment. 
When we pray, he's not taking attendance like, oh, you missed it this morning. Where were you? I was waiting. He's not giving grades on your prayers like, I don't know. Do you know what you're really doing here? No, no, no. He's not doing that. He's spending time with you. Don't get discouraged if you start a rhythm and you miss a time or you miss a day. Just pick up where you left off. I said it a few months ago and I'll say it again. If you don't relate to your spouse one day, it doesn't mean you just cut them off and feel shame and don't talk to them the rest of the week. No, you're like, hey, I'm sorry. We didn't talk yesterday. It was a crazy day. Let's talk today. We can do that with God and say, God, I'm talking to you right now. I'm sorry I missed this morning. I missed our date time. Let's talk now. He's so much more gracious than anyone in our lives. And at the same time, we want to fight for these rhythms. It's important. The last person I want to look at is Daniel. And Daniel, he was taken to Babylon as a captive. And when he went there, he's like, I'm not going to live according to this culture because they worshiped a lot of gods and it was not a good place. He's like, I'm going to just eat the food God says I can eat. And I'm going to still keep my prayer rhythms. And what happened is the king's like, hey, if anyone prays to God or anybody else and not me, I'm going to throw them in the lion's den. Daniel 6.10 says, Daniel always prayed to God three times every day. Three times every day he bowed down on his knees to pray and praise God. Even though Daniel heard about the new law, he still went to his house to pray. He went up to the upper room of his house. He opened the windows that faced toward Jerusalem. Daniel bowed down on his knees and prayed just as he had always done. God was so important to him that he risked his life for the ability to talk to God. That is radical and it inspires me. Where can I fight like Daniel to say, I'm gonna put God first in all of my moments, come on. No matter the cost, no matter what people think of me, no matter what I need to replace in my rhythms that's already not serving me, I'm gonna talk to God in the morning through his word. I'm gonna thank him at lunchtime, I'm gonna worship him. I'm going to go over my day with God in the evening and say, where were you today, God? I see you in those moments. It's too important not to do. I'm too busy not to pray. I'm a citizen of the culture of heaven, and I'm living according to that reality instead of this culture. So he goes to the lion's den, and of course God is with him. He's always with us. And God rescues him. And because of Daniel's prayers the rest of the culture decided to worship God. The king made an edict and they all turned to God because of one person's prayers. The prayers of a righteous person, they're powerful and effective, come on. We have access to God anytime. We have authority because of Jesus and God wants to have a relationship with us. If you're here today and all of this is new to you, You didn't realize that you could have that kind of close, intimate relationship with God. You didn't realize how much he loves you, not because of anything you do, but because of what Jesus has done. You can come to him boldly. I'm gonna give you the chance to trust in him today. So we're gonna close our eyes. We're bowing our heads wherever we're sitting. If you're here today and you say, I wanna trust in Jesus. I wanna make him my savior. I wanna receive what he's done for me. Nobody's looking around, just me. I'm gonna ask you to go ahead, raise your hand right now, right where you're sitting. Let me see it and you can put it back down. Thank you, I see you. You can put it down, thank you. That's awesome. I'm trusting in God today, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate. The Bible says that we receive this free gift of salvation by believing and confessing with our mouth. And so we like to pray together out loud. Just repeat after me. We'll pray with you as a church. We say, God, I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your freedom. I submit my life to you. I'm placing it before you as an offering. I'm trusting you today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That means let it be so. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. He is so, so good.